Good afternoon. My name is Sherry Gottke. I am the VP of Molecular Imaging at United Imaging. I am thrilled to participate in the Industry Partners webinar series and provide you education and information on upcoming topics and, and topics that you may be interested with. Today's topic is Precision Theranostics for Prostate Cancer with the U Explorer. The U Explorer is the two meter total body pet. We are thrilled to have our partners BAMP Health on today's webinar. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Brandon Mancini. He is the medical director at the Grand Rapids Clinic for BAMP Health in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And also on today's agenda is Dr. Harsha Korkarni, who is the chief medical advisor at BAMP Health. Gentlemen, we're thrilled to have you here today. And, and it's a pleasure to introduce you for this topic that is top of mind in the industry. Dr. Mancini. Thank you so much. So yeah, thank you so much, Sherry. It's an honor and privilege today to be able to speak uh, with Dr. Kolkarni. Um, and we truly appreciate the SNMMI uh, Value Initiative and United Imaging uh, for this opportunity to talk on precision diagnostics for prostate cancer with the U-Explorer. As noted, I'm Brandon Mancini, Medical Director of the Grand Rapids Clinic of Banff Health, and I'll be introducing Dr. Harshad Kolkarni following uh, my presentation, uh, who serves as Chief, who serves as Chief Medical Advisor for Banff Health. Here are my disclosures. And so the objectives of today's talk is to introduce you to the BAMP Health platform to discuss the role of Gallium 68 PSMA uh, PET CT imaging in prostate cancer, uh, to review the United Imaging U Explorer total body PET CT, um, and to truly discuss how advancing theranostics in prostate cancer can be facilitated by this amazing technology. So BAMP Health, what is BAMP? stand for. And what that stands for is Bold Advanced Medical Future. And BAMP Health was looking uh, to be founded back in 2018 by Dr. Anthony Chang. Um, and he found particular frustration um, while working in molecular imaging in the inability to translate an idea from preclinical concept to real patient impact. And as a result of that, BAMP Health was founded uh, and we were able to learn from and collaborate with international thought leaders in theranostics um, with several years of due diligence to ensure that we were able to bring the best practices to the world at scale to assist as many patients as we could as quickly as we can in the evolving field of theranostics. And things that we address with the BAMP Health platform are difficulties with infrastructure, technology, and workflows, and all together, we want to optimize molecular imaging and molecular tar targeted radiation therapy uh, for patients with metastatic cancer. Now, again, what is BAMP Health? So we're a global company focused on evolving the industry to make the best radiation pharmaceuticals available and affordable to patients as soon as possible. Our headquarters is in Grand Rapids, Michigan in the United States, and our mission is to achieve artificial intelligence enabled, intelligence based, precision medicine through molecular imaging and molecular targeted radiation therapy. And we have four unifying priorities. Most importantly, optimizing patient outcomes and patient experience, 
ensuring we have good employee safety and work-life balance, and understanding the increased need for both molecular imaging and molecular targeted radiation therapy, uh, the volume uh, that is likely to be necessary in the world to treat these patients quickly and effectively, also looking then, therefore to optimize patient throughput. BAMP Health again is actualizing this intelligence-based precision medicine through AI-enabled molecular imaging and theranostics, and we're building a nationwide network of standardized theranostic centers that are going to be focused on enabling novel therapies and diagnostics to impact patients rapidly. It's the BAMP Health operated precision medicine and theranostics platform uh, is able to support partners uh, in the community, each and every community that we will impact, again, enabling them to innovate through partnerships that are very meaningful, uh, empowering patients to, to become people again. Our flagship center, uh, the, Grand, the BAMP Health Grand Rapids facility is located in the Doug Meyer Medical Innovation Building on Michigan State University's Innovation Park campus. We have 60,000 square feet of this 210,000 square foot building that you see here on the right. And this includes our global headquarters on the seventh floor, as well as the BAMP Health Theranostic Center um, with components uh, including the molecular imaging clinic, the molecular therapy clinic, and our cyclotron eclipsed radio pharmacy that includes kind of levels one and two of this building. Our pharmacy was operationalized in September of 2021 and is fully licensed with the FDA, NRC, and BOP. We're preparing a Lucix utilizing cyclo cyclotron produced, uh, gallium 68, and patient care began in July of this year with the world's first Lucix Elucic, images on the U-Explorer total body PET CT, as well as treating patients with Pluvicto or Lutetium-177 PSMA radio ligand therapy, uh, which started on August 2nd of this year. BAMP Health is very much so purpose built. And so it's very uh, uniquely situated to have a radio pharmacy completely feeding into clinical optimization. And this schematic on the right displays our radio pharmacy here, located in green with our two cyclotrons, again, immediately adjacent to our molecular imaging clinic, which consists of 13 uptake rooms the United Imaging U Explorer Total Body PET CT, a United Imaging U PET MR, which we'll go into more detail shortly, um, as well as immediately uh, below our uh, molecular therapy clinic, including nine treatment rooms and a SPECT CT scan. So this is again set up for large scale commercial manufacturing and distribution from a radio pharmaceutical perspective while complementing and enhancement enhancing patient care and clinical research. The BAMP Health Tier 1 facilities will consist of a radio pharmacy, which again, we have dual GE PET Trace 890 uh, cyclotrons. They have six target ports to produce a wide variety of radio isotopes with dual beam capability and high production capacity. We also have the first in world install of the GE solid target system in which we were able to produce 12 curies of gallium 68 in a single run. And this is highly adaptable to multiple isotopes, and we'll continue work on this over the months ahead um, as we optimize and learn on how to leverage this uh, technology and infrastructure to help patients as quickly as we can. Our state of the art, art radio pharmacy has commercial acumen with research capability. We offer a variety of radio pharmaceuticals at an affordable price and at commercial scale. Again, we have our dual cyclotron PET facility, and you can see the two volts uh, in the top image. Again, fully licensed with the FDA uh, as a manufacturing site, the Michigan Board of Pharmacy and the NRC. Uh, and it's built and equipped in collaboration with Michigan State University. Some additional images here of our radio pharmacy. We have 22 hot cells. Uh, including alpha beta space and research space. And it allows us uh, to have a lot of flexibility um, and opportunity to again, uh, get the needed radio pharmaceuticals produced, distributed and to patients as quickly as possible. And is also set up to ensure that we are adaptable and flexible and nimble in the future as further breakthroughs develop 
and additional research questions and advancements in the theranostic space take place. Our tier one facilities also will have a molecular imaging clinic. And again, noted the United Imaging U Explorer Total Body PET CT is something we're very excited and very proud of. Um, as noted, it's a total body scan, so two meter length scan with ultra high resolution digital imaging. It's 40 times faster and or 40 times lower radiation exposure than a standard PET CT. Um, this potentially allows for uh, implementation into a pediatric patient population where a scan can be done as little as just several minutes or less, um, where maybe no or minimal sedation is required for a pediatric patient if that is the appropriate uh, scan to get for their situation. And this is also potentially opens the doors for more frequent scans. Um, so if we're exposing individuals to less and less radiation, it may be that leveraging this incredible technology with very low radiation exposure could lead to the need for these types of scans to be utilized in screening certain high risk populations uh, moving forward in the future. And again, noted uh, is the high throughput. So doing scans in a matter of minutes um, with little downtime in between will address the immediate need for increased PSMA PET scans and there and other types of PET scans that will likely be necessary um, and kind of take advantage of some of the difficulties that are currently uh, present uh, in incorporating this increased volume uh, to standard center workflows. And with the speed and the imaging resolution and quality, this also opens the door for pharmacokinetic studies that produce uh, invaluable information for pharmaceutical companies and beyond um, as drugs and tracers are developed. Again, we also have the United Imaging UPMR 790 High Definition PET MR, and this is a next generation PET MR. It's a three Tesla magnet with ultra high resolution with HD time of flight capability. Um, and we see expansion beyond oncology into neurology, cardiology, and pediatrics, and are very excited to impact patients um, both on the research and clinical space uh, in the months and years ahead. Finally, uh, in our molecular therapy clinic, uh, we have the GE Star Guide Digital Spec CT. This allows us to visualize the targeted radio ligand therapy and perform dosimetry, kind of addressing the model of intelligence-based precision medicine that BAMP Health is excited about. Uh, it's able to capture a wide variety of isotopes and allows for a personalized patient exposure. Um, and so we are continuing to investigate optimal time bed position um, and time points um, to optimize how this machine can impact patient care uh, and make sure that each and every patient has the most customized, uh, perfect experience possible. Here are a couple of photos of our molecular imaging clinic. Here's the U Explorer Total Body PET CT. One of the premises of, of BAMP Health is, again, the patient experience. And there's been a lot of due diligence uh, prior to opening to ensure that each and every uh, attribute of that patient experience is addressed. And you can notice here that a lot of our rooms have active window spacing with a lot of natural light. This includes incorporation of lead lining into windows, furniture, uh, cabinetry, and so forth to optimize safety of our patients. But to again, elevate the experience that individuals are going through as they make their way through our clinic, try to have them feel as though it's as least of a medical experience as possible, as we know that can create anxiety and ill will. And to continue to kind of promote the well being of loved ones and caregivers uh, that may accompany patients as well, kind of again addressing the total experience for the patient and their family as they come through uh, BAMF Health. Our molecular therapy clinic, again located on the second floor, also has uh, a lot of window space. Um, and this is done on purpose, again, to enhance that experience, to bring more natural light and uh, less of a medical feel to that patient's experience. There's a lot of um, details and a lot of um, living room and or hotel style furniture and cabinetry um, to again, kind of take away from that medical experience as much as possible. Uh, we have nine uh, patient treatment suites, all with their own individualized bathroom um, and ability to uh, kind of have their experience 
be what they would prefer, uh, including adjustments in uh, the coolness or the warmness of the overhead lights, um, the intensity of the light, the temperature of the room, um, TV, no TV, different seating arrangements and so forth. And something that's very unique and that we're proud of as well is that each patient suite has an area to the right here called that we refer to as a front porch um, where uh, as long as it's safe and, and it's something they would prefer to do, they're able to exit their room um, immediately out against the windows, um, get that natural light, be able to people or car watch and kind of get outside of, of kind of a, a standard room um, to again customize that experience. Um, and have uh, more control over uh, their treatment time with our with our facility. And in general, our approach is a multi multidisciplinary approach to molecular imaging and therapy. So we're working in collaboration with the local medical centers and scientists to create this center of excellence. And that includes multi-institutional, multidisciplinary care. Um, Myself and others are being integrated into the local tumor boards of community hospitals to ensure that we are members of the team here. Uh, and it's a policy or, or a process where we're imaging and or treating and returning that individual to their specialist. So again, integrating ourselves into the oncologic care of these individual patients um, and ensuring that they continue to have good relationships um, and follow up care with their providers. Um, uh, both in oncology, urology, uh, and beyond. We're also hopeful for developing residency and fellowship programs in Theranostics and being a location that non-Theranostics residents or those from other institutions can come and spend time at Banff Health uh, to learn uh, about the tremendous uh, hardware and software that we have, the incredible technology in the United Imaging Machines and beyond and really elevate that experience and knowledge so that we can spread um, our experience and uh, change the landscape to how Theranostics is delivered throughout the United States and beyond. And one uh, big aspect of our, our uh, care here is clinical trials, including both pharma sponsored and investigator initiated, and those will continue to develop in the months and years ahead. With that clinical trials platform, um, again, trying to leverage that infrastructure to fulfill our mission of supporting industry partners, conducting all phases of clinical trials for both diagnostic and therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals and devices, and doing so faster, cheaper, and higher quality. And we want to be able to spur innovation uh, to our local and distant academic partners, providing any resources that could be needed um, through this BAMP Health platform to again, advance these ideas and go from research to patient care as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. So again, leveraging our clinics and what are specialized in molecular imaging, molecular target radiation therapy, and our radio pharmacy to create this comprehensive clinical trial solution to bring uh, all of these neat uh, diagnostic and therapeutic opportunities to patients um, as quickly as possible. And so looking forward, uh, so for our molecular imaging and therapy clinics, again, we launched this summer, began imaging and treated patients. We're in continued evaluation of clinical trial involvement, uh, both including national and international clinical trials as far as, as well as uh, investigator initiated trials. And we're ramping up to capacity throughout the remainder of this year and into 2023. Our radio pharmacy is providing gallium 68 PSMA and operationalizing our GE solid target system and GMP. And we're supporting the clinical research needs throughout the area, as noted with academia uh, and non-academic partners uh, to again, serve as this all-inclusive platform to get this technology and all this amazing uh, infrastructure to our scientists, to our researchers, to our experts, and most importantly, our patients as quickly as possible. Now I'll pass it on to Dr. Cole Carney who will speak more on behalf of uh, imaging with the to U Explorer Total Body PET CT and the future landscape of uh, diagnostics and prostate cancer. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, thanks again um, to Sherry and um, and Josh and United Imaging for uh, for the invitation. Uh, I would continue the presentation with Calium 68 PSME 11 PET CT. So the role of 
PSMA 11 in men with prostate cancer, for which it was FDA approved, is in patients with suspected metastasis who are candidates for initial definitive therapy and for patients with suspected recurrence based on elevated PSA levels. I would like to touch on future perspectives. What are the potential of uh, PSMA 11, uh, gallium 68, especially with the total body PET CT, what Brandon just talked about, is the evaluation of therapy response and independent assessment of tumor burden in patients with prostate cancer for personalized theranoids. So gallium 68 PSMA 11 was FDA approved for the initial staging. The PSMA pre-radical prostatectomy trial in which the PET reds um, were actually compared with the pelvic lymph node histopathology and the specificity of 90% on a negative predictive value of 84% were found. In the biochemical recurrence uh, trial in which this particular um, modality was compared against composite reference standard, uh, the detection levels for PSA more than or equal to two was more than 90%. So early recurrence and response evaluation using the PSMA PET is actually beneficial because the early treatment, which is enabled because of that, of advanced prostate cancer with PSMA targeted radioligand therapy is actually beneficial in prolonging the survival. So earlier you detect the disease, better is the survival of the patients. The PSMA PET also validated higher rates of metastatic disease for the European Association of Urology Biochemical Recurrence Risk Groups, which are shown in an international multicenter study. So it was demonstrated that men with high risk biochemical recurrence, according to those EAU prostate cancer guidelines and, and BCP have higher rates of metastatic disease. There are also discordant subgroups like patients who had metastatic disease in low risk patients and no disease in high risk patients, which really warrants the inclusion of PSMA PET to redefine the risk assessment. And in this particular example, I would like to highlight, uh, which was published back in, in 2015, uh, I would like to highlight that this 76 year old patient who had had external beam radiotherapy to the bone metastasis and hormone therapy, the PSMA PET CT before the treatment revealed progressive bone and lymph node metastasis. And you can see in the middle, the lutetium PSMA um, whole body scans after the treatment. And after the treatment, there was a complete remission of the disease. What is really interesting is that the PSA changed from 0 0.05 nanogram per milliliter to 0 0.01 nanogram per milliliter. So in advanced stages of the disease, the tumor bur burden actually does not correlate with the PSA value. Therefore, gallium 11 PET CT enables sensitive detection of the tumor burden independent of the PSA level. In this particular study, the PSMA PET CT was able to detect or differentiate true progression from a flare phenomenon. In patient A, the, the tumor burden actually increased, but you can also see that the PSA is actually decreasing. So this was, this was actually a true progression of the disease. Whereas in this particular patient, also with a fall in PSA, there was an initial increase in the PSMA expression of the tumors. But after at 12 weeks, um, there is a, a, a response to the treatment, which really shows that the flare phenomenon can actually occur after the PSMA targeted radio ligand therapy, and that can be truly differentiated based upon the PSMA PET CT results. Now, over, over time, this particular slide shows really the development of the imaging technology right from the 1990s up to the total body PET imaging from today. So the total body PET CT, as we touched upon, has, um, has shown to be highly sensitive of uh, detecting very small lesions. So first human studies on the U Explorer total body PET CT have been performed. And Explorer is the first medical imaging scanner of any kind capable of capturing three-dimensional images of the entire body at the same time. This is the first study actually to show the kinetics of an injected radio tracer throughout the entire body. So it actually shows uh, the pharmacokinetic studies, which is very important for the drug development. 
the diagnostic diagnostic quality scans using acquisition times of approximately one minute or even lesser can be obtained and we can go down for the injected doses of 25 megabecquerel uh, to to still acquire a good diagnostic quality images and one important thing is it also enables delayed imaging just because of the high sensitivity of the scanner. So on the left side, you're seeing the dynamic images and on the right side, the delayed images for this particular subject up to 10 hours after the injection, which still has a high diagnostic quality. So at BAMP, we have also performed a uh, dynamic uh, PET scans, which is the, the initial uh, PET scans. And interestingly, the software itself enables you to reconstruct the images at different time points. So what you can see from left to right is in as low as 10 second acquisition, you can actually see uh, the PSMA positive tumor lesions in the body very well. So this actually does not change the clinical management. Just acquiring within 10 seconds, even though the quality of scans may not be the best, but you can still get a clinically relevant information, which is actually very important if you're dealing with a high throughput of the patients. So I'd like to show as examples the first patients which are scanned at BAMP Health with the ILU6 and the U Explorer. Now, just a disclaimer is that these are individual case reports, not published studies, and the efficacy and safe safety of the drug ILU6 cannot be drawn or inferred by these case reports. The first particular patient was a 66-year-old gentleman with a history of stage 3C CT2 prostate adenocarcinoma Gleason 9 with a pretreatment PSA of around 16. He had undergone external beam radiotherapy to the prostate and seminal vesicles and to the pelvic lymph nodes, which was completed in April 2020. This was followed by biochemical recurrence of the disease and bi biopsy confirmed metastatic disease because of which the patient underwent five cycles of chemotherapy. Now, this chemotherapy was not tolerated very well by the patient and was discontinued because of peripheral neuropathy. He also progressed uh, with enzalutamide uh, with, with variable dosing, and additionally, he had developed complications of spinal cord compression because of which he had developed a palliative radiation treatment. So these were his scans, which were really showing uh, the, the multiple PSMA positive osseous metastasis, which you can see a very high PSMA expression in the, in the lesions, and because of which the change of management and indication for a lutetium PSMA radioligand therapy was thus confirmed. The patient number two was a 76-year-old patient with Gleason 9 prostate cancer. He had actually undergone two cycles of PSMA radioligand therapy in Germany, after which there was subsequent biochemical improvement of the disease. So as a new adjuvant uh, treatment, you, we wanted to find out the status of the disease, even though the PSA has decreased significantly from 36 to about 2. So this, uh, these were his uh, PSMA scans, which showed that there is a persistent PSMA positive disease within the prostate gland and bilateral retroperitoneal lymph nodes, as well as low grade uptake in the sclerotic osseous metastasis. So overall, the disease was stable and that's why there is no change in the management. What is also very important is that you can also pinpoint um, the, uh, the change in the PSMA expression of these metastases, which also uh, correlates with the healing or increased sclerosis in these metastases. The patient number three was a uh, patient with Gleason 8 prostate adenocarcinoma, in which with a pretreatment PSA of 9, he had undergone initial treatment with hormone therapy, which was discontinued uh, because of untoward effects. And then, then the patient actually went on to, uh, to get some unconventional treatments like homeopathic remedies, but eventually uh, developed complications of left-sided hydronephrosis and also had bilateral lung metastasis. So there was a definite evidence of progression of the disease and uh, an alternative treatment option was sought. The total body PET CT on uh, 27th of July demonstrated bilateral disseminated PSM expressing uh, lung metastasis, which you can see with the red arrows, which are measuring one centimeter or less throughout. There are also several intensi intensely PSMA positive bone metastases as well as lymphadenopathy, which can be seen very clearly with these high quality, high resolution scans. The 
patient number four was a Gleason 7 prostate cancer. He had a pretreatment PSA of 3.2. He had undergone um, surgery as well as, uh, as well as radiation therapy. He actually underwent one cycle of PSMA targeted radioligand therapy back in August, and uh, after which there was some improvement, but because of biochemical progression of the disease, uh, the surgeon wanted to find out the current status of the disease. And what we found out was on the total body PET CT is that there was a PSMA positive left internal iliac lymph node lesion, which, was, which measured 2.4 centimeters, also with a central necrosis, which can be uh, very well identified here. In addition, what really potentially changes the management is a sub-centimeter PSMA avid lymph node lesion in the left paraaortic region of the upper abdomen, which, uh, which definitely uh, warrants at least a consideration of the change of management. So I'd like to now show some clinical case examples in which the total body PET CT actually had a direct theranostic or therapeutic impact uh, in, the, in the management of the prostate cancer. In uh, the, the first case is that of a more than 92 year old uh, gentleman who presented to us with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer. He had actually failed two lines of hormone therapy and he was actually enrolled in a clinical trial involving additional immune checkpoint inhibitor, and then underwent a radium-223 uh, treatment, which, as we know, is a non-theranostic radionuclide, but approved for bone metastasis of prostate cancer. Although its quality of life was stable and the pain relatively well-managed with palliative care, the disease continued to progress. Okay. And because of the age of the patient and also several comorbidities, uh, the, the oncologist deemed uh, that the patient was not fit for chemotherapy. So we did a U Explorer Calium 68 PSMA 11 PET CT, which demonstrated highly intense uptake in the extensive bone metastasis, as I would show in the next slide. And based upon which the patient actually underwent uh, the, the Pruvector treatment uh, a week later at, at Banff Health. And we also did the whole body spec CT using Star Guide, which confirmed the highly intense Pruvector accumulation in the metastasis. Now, uh, there was a very high uh, target to background ratio, and based on this uptake, we could actually conclude that there is a high probability of response to the treatment, and actually the patient had a good response uh, to the treatment based upon his PSA levels. The treatment was tolerated very well uh, without any side effects and without any compromise of the quality of life in this nonagenarian, which would have been extremely unlikely uh, with chemotherapy. So this really, uh, this example really shows we treat what we see and see what we treat. On the left side, what you're seeing is total body head CT images using gallium 68 PSMA 11, showing extensive PS, uh, PSMA avid uh, metastasis with actually a sink effect. So you see very little uptake in the saliva glands and also in the kidneys, but uh, but very high target to background ratio. And the PSA b before treatment was 119.3, and so. Uh, a week later, when we did the treatment, we also do 24 hours later, uh, confirm the biodistribution of, um, of lutetium PSMA 617 in the metastasis. You can actually see, even though the resolution of lutetium 177 spec is not as high of, of the uh, as that of the PET, you can see very high uptake and high target to background ratio in the spec CT. The second patient was um, was poorly differentiated metastatic adenocarcinoma of the prostate with multiple lymph node metastases, which extended from the neck region down to the retroperitoneal uh, region. So he was first diagnosed actually in 211. The first uh, diagnosis was uh, Gleason uh, six, but then eventually that was uh, that was um, uh, revived. Uh, he had he had already undergone surgery and then uh, multiple external beam radiotherapy. So he actually underwent two cycles of uh, lutetium PSMA radiolangin therapy in, in Germany, after which he, has, he had had partial remissions. Um, then again, uh, underwent two more cycles, which, which uh, led to a significant response to the disease. And the disease was actually uh, persistently in partial remission uh, under additional enzalutamide treatment. Until about uh, three to four years later, when there was a slowly rising PSA, uh, he had also had some radiation cystitis, but we performed the total body PET CT, which showed a new progression of the disease with increase in size and uptake of those lymph node metastases. So you can see here in the total body calium 68 PSMA 11 PET CT, uh, very high uh, resolution and high target to background ratio. 
of the uptake in the supraclavicular lymph node down to the retroperitoneal lymph node. You can also see that the patient is with a, with a catheter because of his radiation cystitis. And uh, he actually underwent the fifth and sixth cycles of the treatment. So you can actually assess the response to the treatment. Of course, not only the, uh, the PSA uh, fell from 1.5 to 0 0.9 to about a, a couple of days later, later uh, a couple of a couple of days earlier, when the patient reported that the PSA dropped further down to 0 0.6, but also also under the treatment, you, you can actually uh, you can actually compare the images of the lutetium PSMA spec CTs after the cycle five and cycle six. You can see that some of the lymph nodes are not detectable anymore, and all of the other lymph nodes have decreased significantly in both size and uptake, so both molecular as well as morphological response of the disease. The patient would be undergoing a follow up. PET CT in, in about two months' time, in which we would be reassessing the tumor burden and then deciding upon the future course of the treatment. The patient number three was uh, a 73 year old gentleman who had undergone prostatectomy and also um, also had some uh, some external beam radiotherapy, multiple lines of hormone therapy, and, and he was progressing uh, with PSA only of 0 0.29. So uh, the oncologist wanted to find out the exact tumor burden. As you can see, uh, the PSMA PET CT showed numerous PSMA, uh, PSMA avid uh, bone metastases throughout the axial and the appendicular skeleton. And uh, it was primarily in the thoracic spine and the bilateral ribs. And the patient actually underwent chemotherapy as per, as per the standard, uh, uh, standard of care guidelines. And after uh, a couple of months, the patient presented to us again, which shows a significant response uh, to the treatment and the, and the chemotherapy could be uh, continued. The pa uh, patient number four uh, was actually the, the very first patient treated at, at BAMF, and, uh, and he had actually the uh, pre-therapy and post-therapy total body PET CT, as well as two cycles of Pluvicto. So the 78-year-old gentleman with Gleason 7 prostate adenocarcinoma had a pre-treatment PSA of 13.1. Now the history dates back to 1999. Uh, you can see a very slow and indolent course of the disease. Uh, the pathology de uh, demonstrating tumor extension into the base of the right seminal vesicle and negative margins. His post-surgery PSA was 0.1, after which he underwent salvage pelvic radiation therapy completed in May 2000. And between 2005 uh, up to 2019, the patient had been on intermittent hormone therapy and, and was relatively stable. But in 2019, the patient presented with progression of the disease because of which he was treated with multiple cycles of lutetium PSMA radioligand therapy in Germany. So first three cycles between December 2019 and May 2020, and then further, uh, further two cycles between August and November 2021. There was response after both these phases of lutetium PSMA radioligand therapy, but the patient unfortunately had a further PSMA, PSA progression and presented to us in end of June, early uh, uh, July for, for PET CT. So his total body PET CT demonstrated a significant PSM expression again in the bone metastasis. You can see a very high target to background ratio. Um, uh, particularly, you know, you can identify singular lesions uh, extremely well with this kind of a technology. So based upon this, the patient was initiated on Lubicto treatment. So he underwent two further cycles of the treatment, the sixth and the seventh being in August and September, respectively. So the PSA fell from more than 6 to, uh, to about 0 0.53 uh, end of November. And this was actually confirmed. The response was actually confirmed on the total body PET CT, which the patient underwent earlier this month. So the, these were the pre-therapy gallium 68 PSMA 11 PET CT images showing a high PSMA expression in the bone metastasis. And after two cycles or two more cycles of Pluvicto in all three phases, of the treatment, uh, there is a response in these lesions with increasing sclerosis. Now this again highlights the fact that gallium 68 PSMA 11 PET CT is uh, is is significant in accurate therapy monitoring and response assessment. So I, I would like to summarize by saying that prostate cancer imaging using the total body PET CT U Explorer and ELU6 is a fast, sensitive high resolution total body precision radiomolecular imaging with a significant impact on the disease management. Not only is it helpful for initial staging, but also for biochemical recurrence and biochemical persistence in which it can be detected, the disease can be detected at very low or even lower PSA levels because of the high sensitivity of the scanner. 
Since PSA is not a reliable marker for advanced stage disease, we need to rely on reliable molecular imaging like TSMA PET CT. It confirms accurately the volume of the metastatic disease and to plan the treatment better. And especially for the prostate cancer theranostics, it is helpful for patient selection for the PSMA targeted radiomolecular therapy and also for evaluation of the treatment response. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, this is Sherry Gottke. I am thrilled to be moderating this session about theranostics. I would like to invite you to put your questions in the chat so Dr. Mancini and Dr. Kulkarni can answer them. I do have a question that was submitted. So uh, Dr. Mancini, what patient population do you currently see utilizing theranostics for prostate cancer and where do you see its expansion in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so right now in the United States, the FDA approved indication is for patients with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer uh, with PSMA positive lesions uh, previously treated with taxane based chemotherapy and a novel anti androgen therapy. And so this largely encompasses the patient population that we're treating currently. Uh, most of our referrals are coming from our medical oncology colleagues uh, who have previously deemed uh, the patient uh, uh, needing additional therapy, such as taxane based chemotherapy. Um, we're also starting to see several patients who are uh, too old or frail or have medical comorbidities that don't allow them to receive taxane based chemotherapy, and they have been referred for consideration of Pluvicto, and we have found that payers uh, have been supportive of use of Pluvicto in this patient population as long as there's medical necessity to move forward with therapy and no other viable treatment options. Um, and as we continue to progress, as data uh, continues to be released, um, we had a nice press release uh, just about a week ago or ten, uh, 10 days ago on the 5th from Novartis about meeting a progression-free survival uh, outcome in their study looking at pre-chemotherapy delivery of Pluvicto in a, a metastatic castration resistant population. Um, so that's the nat next natural step uh, of utilization of Pluvicto and, and similar medications in prostate cancer. Um, it's likely that we're gonna see some uh, emerging data and additional studies looking at the hormone sensitive phase. And even those that may be oligometastatic um, in combination with definitive surgery or external beam radiation to the prostate. So I think we're going to continue to see this moving earlier and earlier uh, in the disease course, obviously benefiting more and more patients, but also ensuring that doing so uh, is safe and effective um, as those patients would live longer. So we may see some later effects of the therapies as we kind of move it earlier. So a lot of neat things. We're kind of just at the cusp of, of where this is going to go uh, in the States. Great. What other pathologies, as a follow-on question, what other pathologies do you plan to do theranostics with in the future? What's the next step after prostate? Sure, and Dr. Kulkarni can definitely add as well. Um, so absolutely, we treat with Lutathera as well, so neuroendocrine tumors. Um, there are a, There is a lot of momentum um, for FAP um, or other kind of tumor microenvironment type targets as well. Um, so as these targets continue to be uh, discovered and, and evaluated for uh, efficacy and safety, uh, we will continue to expand that. So the hope is at a minimum that most, if not all, solid tumors would have some ability to deliver a theranostics treatment um, and hopefully also potentially expansion into lymphomas and other uh, hematologic malignancies and even non-malignant uh, conditions as well. Okay, so I have another question. Is spec CT imaging of 177 Lou performed routinely post therapy with PSMA 11? Yeah, Dr. Kulkarni, do you want to expand on kind of our strategy at BAMP and what your experience has been previously? Yeah, uh, thanks, Brandon, and thanks, Sherry. Yeah, it's a great question. So, a lutetian PSMA uh, post therapy spec CT is something which we do routinely. There's absolutely no exception for it. And this is actually continuing the experience also in, you know, in, in other parts of the world, uh, Germany, where we know that, you know, the principle of theranostics is really that we are seeing what you're treating and we are treating what you're seeing. And so it's important to really note the biodistribution of 
uh, of the uh, of, of that biotracer in a body because it can vary from patient to patient. That is number one. And number two is uh, it also uh, you can derive very important molecular information from a spec CT, which you otherwise are missing if you're looking only at the PSA. Because as, as I just pointed out in one of my slides, that uh, PSA is not a uh, not a very accurate marker for advanced stages of prostate cancer. And there you can actually monitor the disease status under the treatment by doing a, uh, for example, 24 hour uh, later, the spec CT, and you can compare, let's say, apples and apples between the cells. And then, of course, uh, number three is you can actually make clinical decisions based on uh, based on mutation spec CT. So we've had, for example, patients having uh, excellent response. You can actually vary. You know, you can actually tailor the treatment regimen according to the disease status, and uh, and that's why I think that is something which you cannot do without. That's great. Thank you for that question. Another question in the thread is, why did your multidisciplinary slide not include nuclear medicine physicians? If it didn't, it should have, and it does. Um, so I think as a as a team here, um, we have uh, Dr. Kolkarni with a history of uh, being trained in nuclear medicine and theranostics and myself in radiation oncology. Um, and we participate with our uh, local tumor boards, and that definitely includes kind of the full team, um, as well as Banff Health, uh, including medical oncology, radiology, um, who's typically a mix of, of um, uh, radiologists and or nuclear medicine physicians in that individual group and so forth. So, um, no, we definitely fully support, and, and that's part of our, our main multidisciplinary approach is to include uh, such physicians. Great yeah, question, that's a great that, answer. That's a great answer, uh, really. And I, I would just add to it, you know, uh, we are, our stress is, or, or you know, there's a new brand of physicians for us, theranostics physicians, you can you can say, and 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 everyone is welcome, not only in the, the, the nuclear medicine. So, I mean, you're basically practicing, the focus is really on uh, on, on a patient-specific or patient-targeted approach uh, and, and based on the physicals, or based on the principles of, of theranostics. And, and of course, uh, uh, if, if it was, uh, that was, that was definitely not meant, but, uh, but that was inclusive of all the, all the physicians. Yes, it's been done. In, in different areas of the world at different methodologies. One question we got was, how do you educate the patient that theranostics is an option, or is it working through your referring physicians that are sending patients, does the referring physician educate them, or is it a, a parallel activity? Yeah, I think as practice has kind of emerged here in the United States with the recent approval, March 23rd, and our clinic opening in August, I think uh, there's been a lot of quick momentum as far as the medical oncologists getting on board, um, urologists, radiation oncologists of the local communities and from afar, um, where they kind of initiate the discussion, but honestly kind of defer uh, the nuts and bolts to the formal consultation with our facility. Um, so that's been the most standard practice. Um, but again, even if patients don't qualify, they are asking <laughs> their physicians about Pluvicto and, and so forth. So sometimes we may even see consultations where the patient doesn't technically qualify for therapy yet, um, but they want to learn more about it and they want to know when it may be integrated into their treatment uh, path. And so uh, mostly it has been us educating the patient and the physicians that we work with. And again, enhancing why it's so important to have that multidisciplinary disciplinary approach and to be present on these tumor boards because um, with that visibility with those communications that happen during the formal portion of tumor boards and then before and after you build incredible relationships you have awesome conversations about the intricacies of this treatment um, and we've really seen a lot of uh, momentum kind of build um, as a, as a result of that yeah i love that patients are getting excited about the possibilities as we move on uh, nuclear medicine and molecular imaging to the future I have to ask this question. What advantages did you see using a two meter PET for theranostics over traditional PET systems? Is there or is there not something that you've noticed? Well, I'll just uh, start by saying, you know, that really uh, was extremely patient friendly because that's something which is, which needs to be, you know, initiated with. Uh, I mean, all of all the patients scanned, uh, we have, I mean, they've had PET at some point in the past, 
on other PET scanners, and, and there was a, a world of difference in the patient experience. So that is something which we need to highlight because it's something which, which we in the nuclear medicine community or the diagnostics community uh, really miss on is, you know, what is the patient experience? And that's something which we have really uh, laid a lot of emphasis on. And that was one single most important aspect. Apart from that, um, as I did point out in, in some of the slides, and of course, uh, the, the, the mode of the presentation was to have, uh, to show as many, you know, pictures as possible, which speak like, a thousand words. So, I mean, we had uh, detected very small lesions, which we, which we, which we really uh, do not cannot compare. There need to be head-to-head -head studies to be able to uh, really see what is the exact advantage. But from my experience, I can say that that you know uh, the ease and the detectability and the confidence which the which the reading uh, radiologists or nuclear medicine physicians have with this PET CT does definitely make a difference. Uh, and 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 that adds to the diagnostic value of uh, of this particular total body PET CT. Yeah, and just to briefly add to that, as a specific patient, I mean, we scanned a six foot three, three hundred and fifteen pound gentleman with a history of claustrophobia. Um, and by having the U Explorer and being able to do that total body PET in just a handful of minutes, um, and just honestly, the experience of um, going through that machine and someone described it as kind of feeling as if they were up in the clouds type of thing. So more of a positive experience, not kind of the daunting uh, of a 25 minute, 40 minute PET scan and so forth. And so that person did not take any medication for the PET scan and had zero issues with it. So I think those experiences um, are just tremendous and continue to build up over time. As I've been lucky enough to be in your center and, and observe things, I'm seeing your average on table time scan time is five minutes. So and, I, and I remember, that, and remember, we can go down to as low as 30 seconds. And in fact, we are um, about to submit, uh, I mean, since this is an SNMI forum, so uh, an abstract for the SNMI in which we would demonstrate. The diagnostic value of uh, of going as low as thirty seconds. So one of my slides also pointed out, which was actually made of uh, made by our our, our uh, lead technologist Dr. Pasi, in which he showed that you know reconstruction with as low as ten seconds does uh, detect all the lesions, but thirty seconds gives us really all the information. We do not miss out on anything. What a what a five minute scan does. That's great. That's great. We have another question, and I'm really appreciative of everyone participating. Are you open to new clinical trials, and can you can you handle other isotopes such as copper sixty four? Yeah, and Harshad can add to this, but the answer is yes. The short answer is yes. Um, we do have upcoming uh, clinical trials kind of along those same lines. So from both an imaging uh, and a therapeutic perspective, honestly, we are interested in, in working with everyone and uh, kind of discussing all potential ideas because we do want to leverage this platform to help uh, as many patients as possible. That's why we're here. We have these tools. We have a lot of uh, a nice aspects of the infrastructure to get all of these neat tracers and advance the science quickly. So the answer is yes, any and all. Um, and our team is always available to meet uh, if anyone ever wants to chat. Great. Just just to quickly add on to Please. that, you did mention copper sixty four. So I mean that's that's a very attractive radionuclide because of the longer uh, half life, and you know you have, you have zirconium eighty nine. So yes, I mean we are definitely open to clinical trials and. What is the really a distinct advantage to just uh, you know try to answer your earlier question is with these longer lived radioisotopes. You can actually do pre therapeutic dosimetry with these radioisotopes, which is otherwise not possible with any other PET scan in the world. It's on the total body PET CT when you have the whole whole body pharmacokinetics over a long period of time, and and there have been studies which have shown that you know. You can uh, you can image FDG, for example, as as uh, late as 12 hours, but with copper 64, you can actually go as late as three days after the injection, and that will allow you to do a pre-therapeutic dosimetry, which is really which would really uh, you, you know an, uh, a hallmark of theranostics, and it would really uh, bring a revolution. So to say. Yeah. One last question. We're at uh, four minutes to the top of the hour. How hard is it to set up a theranostics center outside? of the academic hospital system? Yeah, that's a very uh, interesting question and it could take quite some time to, to really get into the weeds. But I mean, 
I think honestly, with with great community support, you have to have buy in from from support from an infrastructure perspective, obviously land capital um, and so forth, a, a very comprehensive team that are willing to think outside of the box and also from unique disciplines, whether that's nuclear medicine, uh, physics, um, built environment, engineers, uh, radio chemists and so forth. I mean, you kind of need that nidus of a very strong team, plus again, the capital and the location to do so for it to happen. But BAMP was founded in 2018 and, and we were opened four years later. Um, and that's in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of a lot of things um, uniquely kind of uh, getting in the way. Um, and so there are things that uh, this is definitely uh, achievable and reproducible. There's a lot of time and effort and capital necessary, but absolutely with the right team and the right mission, without a doubt, this can be done. That's great. I have no more questions. Again, Dr. Mantini, Dr. Kulkarni, uh, the SNMMI uh, team. We couldn't do this without Catherine Lamb and the team. And I also want to thank my product manager, Josh Wiley, for helping us set it up, put it together, and uh, bring this interesting topic to uh, the top of mind. Have a great afternoon, thank you everybody. Very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.